Okay, well, I'm, I'm Warren Hill from Mesa, Arizona, and um, we're going to talk a little bit today about thinking differently, about a new approach to selecting IOLs that I, that I find very exciting, and that Hogstreit has supported this research for at least six years. And so this is an overnight sensation, six years in the making, so to speak. And it's IOL power selection by pattern recognition. And this offers some amazing opportunities, not only for what we're doing today, but also what we may be doing um, six months from now, six years from now, or maybe 10 years from now. Now, pro a long-term project like this is not something that one person does. This was very much a team effort. And uh, two of our core investigators are here, Dr. Abu Lafia, also Dr. Goldblum from Basel, Switzerland. And, um, a lot of the work was done by MathWorks, one of the largest such companies in the world. And we also had as core investigators at Lee Wong and Doug Koch at Baylor University. We currently have 24 investigators in 13 countries in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, North and South America, Asia, India, and Australia. So this is a very large effort by a lot of people. And in the very near future, every one of you have the potential to be involved and I'll show you how that will work in just a minute. So when we go into the OR and we're putting in a multifocal lens, a toric lens, a monofocal lens for our mother-in-law where it absolutely positively has to be right, what plays in the background is really IOL power. And up until now, what we've done is we put numbers into a formula and we hope for the best. And um, this is the elephant in the room. And how do we know what we're gonna get? Well, we refract the patient at three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and we see how well we did. What if you could have some idea how well you would do before surgery? And this is part of the, the focus of this, this new project. Now just briefly, um, we'll t talk about accuracy for, for most physicians. This is based on the Haggis Formula Optimization Database. Dr. Haggis in Würzburg, Germany, and, and myself in Arizona for more than a decade have optimized um, physician databases, and this has been a free service that we've done. And on my side of the Atlantic, I have about 260,000 cases. And this is what we found from this. And that is less than 1% of physicians are at 92% or better, even though we all think we are. If you actually look at the data, it's less than 1%. The next tier is 6% um, within uh, half a diopter, and that's about, and uh, that's for 84% within half a diopter, so that's 6% of physicians. And the vast majority of physicians are at 78%. Now, what's interesting is this is 78% after the removal of outliers and after the optimization of lens constants. When you look at the raw databases, it's usually between 72 and 76%. And we see this number over and over and over again, which means, in part, it's technology-driven. So if we're putting in multifocal lenses, toric lenses, monofocal lenses, and we have high expectations on the part of our patients, this is what 78% looks like in terms of refractive accuracy. And I think, you know, we all can do better. So what we're going to talk about is a new way to select an IOL power uh, based in pattern recognition. And the advantage of pattern recognition is that it deals with adaptive learning, which means the ability to perform a task based solely on data and independent of what was previously known. Current methods that we have are based on what's previously understood, such as regression methods. It's also self-organizing, which means it has its own ability uh, to represent uh, the data, and it's well-suited to solving the Chinese puzzle, that's the human eye. For any axial length, think of how many possible combinations there are of central corneal power, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, white to white and it becomes a really daunting problem. And linear regression algorithms or even polynomial regression algorithms are always going to miss some of those cases. We use pattern recognition all the time, and every person in this room probably has a pretty good idea as to who all these people are. Think of how little information you're being given and how well the brain is able to process this. Well, in the world of mathematics, we can take a, we can take, um, a organized set of data and we can look at it as a pattern. And these were the parameters that, that were chosen uh, for us by MathWorks, axial length, anterior chamber depth, central corneal power, and spherical equivalent for a given IOL power. And using scary fast computers and very sophisticated mathematics, we can reduce these patterns into predictions 
for IOL power. And here's an example of how this works. This is using an artificial neural network, which is uh, much less sophisticated technology, but it illustrates this very nicely. In this box, we're going to put a thousand random points, and they're generated by something called a Manhattan distance generator, which means the, the points are the absolute sum of the Cartesian coordinates. And if you look at them individually, they look like city blocks, and that's where the term Manhattan distance comes from. We're going to employ a, a mathematical tool called feature extraction and feature matching, and we're going to try and figure out what is the underlying pattern. And we're going to give the artificial neural network 5,000 tries to see if it can get it. I don't think any of us could look at this and see what the pattern is. So we put this in our computer. Here's 400 cycles, 120 cycles, um, 500 cycles. And at 5,000 cycles, the artificial neural network was actually able to figure out the underlying pattern from, from seeming chaos. So it created its own representation or organization of the data. This is very powerful stuff. So compared to regression formulas, this is really a, a next level approach. Now there are a lot of different ways we can do this. We can use things called Gaussian process methods, stochastic process methods, polynomial models, Krieging. And in the world of engineering-based statistical models, there are a lot of different approaches. And we settled on this because it was best for this particular uh, application. And you would think, well, this is a pretty geeky thing, radial basis function, what the hell is that? Well, it turns out it's everywhere. If you have an iPhone in your, in your pocket, chances are part of uh, that software uses radial basis functions. And it's used by the oil exploration uh, community to <laughs> predict the behavior of um, oil fields. Um, the agriculture and automotive industry uses this a lot to calibrate engines. Um, if Interpol wants to find the bad guy at Terminal 5 at Heathrow Airport. They use this for facial recognition software. And um, it's ubiquitous in the forward forecasting financial community. They use this to figure out what the Dow Jones is going to do, what individual stocks are going to do. And you can take sound, which is, which is basically a pattern. You can remove noise and produce noiseless outputs. And one of the more common applications is fingerprint identification. So if you have an iPhone, and you have the, the app that has you put your fingerprint on it to recognize you, that is a radial basis function. And what is it? It's, it's pattern recognition. And it's now finding its way into other fields of medicine, such as cardiology. Uh, EKG is what? It's a pattern. And we all learn these as medical students. And we, have, we struggled with, you know, torsade de points and, and um, you know, all the different types of, uh, of unusual arrhythmias. This is T-wave alternans. And the thing about T-wave alternands is if there's, a, if there's a microvolt variation in the T-wave amplitude from one beat to the next, it's a marker of sudden cardiac death. Now, when you have an EKG, the printout looks at the pattern, and it can find things with a lot greater sensitivity than we might be able to do using you know, just, just our eyes looking at it. So how do we develop this as a calculator? Well, again, with the people at MathWorks, what we did was we developed an organized pattern of data, and I, w I won't go into actually how we picked the various factors, but that was a very long process. And we started with 13 factors, you know, such as preoperative spherical equivalent, gender, spherical aberration, pupil size, a lot of different things. And we found that axial length, central corneal power, and anterior chamber depth for a given spherical equivalent in IOL power gave us the best um, outcomes. We present this data to the radial basis function act, um, activation functions, and then we calculate the difference between what we know the correct answer to be against a training set, against what it tells us, and then through a backward propagation phase, we can actually refine and refine and refine the outcomes, just like we did with that pattern with all those little dots, until we can, we can come up with a solution that does a very nice job. Now, the great thing about artificial intelligence is sometimes the more factors you give it, the more accurate it, is, it may not become due to something called overfitting the data. And if you put 13 factors in, it may not be nearly as accurate as it is with three or four. And that's because we're asking the algorithm to actually think, to do a sophisticated form of data interpolation and come up with a correct answer. So I'll share with you some of the initial things we found. And this is where things really start to get exciting. This is um, 600 and something cases, one of the very first databases we looked at. And the first thing we discovered is that this has no bias. 
so it doesn't know that 21 millimeters is a short axial length and 28 millimeters is a long axial length. All it knows is it's a pattern. So there's no calculation bias. And it can take a cloud of seemingly chaotic data and turn it into a straight line. Very, very powerful stuff. So we knew that we had something uh, worthwhile. Now the point of all this, you know, it, it's a fun intellectual exercise and, and for math geeks like us, it's a, it's, it's a lot of fun. But the whole point is patient safety and physician confidence. And you know, we've all been in, a, in the position where we use three formulas and they're all telling us completely different um, IOL power and we know the patient's very demanding and you know, you know what that feeling, li feeling is like the night after surgery when, you, when you're gonna go in and see the patient the next day, you know, did we get this right? Well, we built into this calculation method a way of knowing if we're gonna get it right or knowing at least that we have a better chance of getting it right. Now, in the world of engineering-based statistical models, there are things um, called boundary models. And engineers use this all the time, but ophthalmologists have never heard of it. And what a boundary model is, is something that tells us if we're likely to have a given level of accuracy. So this is central corneal power plotted against axial length, kind of the characteristic cloud that kind of goes down and to the right. And what we can do is we can mathematically build a boundary model so that we know the points that are gonna give us the correct answer. And in this case, it's to about a 90% accuracy within half a diopter. And we can identify those points that are outside the boundary model, and we can flag those for the user. So this is a boundary model for central corneal power against axial length. This is an image of the very first artificial intelligence uh, calculator using at my, just Microsoft Excel as the user interface. And I've shown the, the, the four boundary models down below. So we're gonna calculate for Plano, and these are represented by these, these little green dots. So here's Plano, here's our central corneal power, here's our anterior chamber depth, and here's our axial length. And you can see that all four of these points reside within the boundary model. So we get a calculation, and we get another uh, piece of information which says it's an inbounds calculation. So we can actually calculate the boundary status of the pattern recognition algorithm. If we have an inbounds calculation, we probably have a 90% chance that we're gonna get what it is we want. So the calculation methodology thinks for itself and talks back to you. And again, the way we normally do this is we put numbers in a, in a formula, as, as Adi mentioned, and we hope for the best. So here we have another level of physician confidence and patient safety. So here's another example where early on we had a, a short axial length, something like 22 millimeters. We didn't have enough cases to generate a boundary model that went that far and we were outside the boundary model, we get an out of bounds statement. So again, another level of, of confidence. So uh, a measurement's only as good as our ability to know what it means, and uh, testing is what tells us if we're doing the right thing. So let me share with you some of the initial testing and then where we are today in the development of this process. So when we first started the testing, we had about 600 and 81 eyes, and these were all done on the lens star and all completely normal eyes. And we looked at the accuracy of the RBF methodology compared to the Barrett Universal 2 formula, the Olson formula, Holiday 2, Haggis, Holiday 1, SRK, T, and Hoffer. And we did very, very well. But the flaw in this is these were the cases used to develop the algorithm. So that's not, that's not really a valid assessment. But it did get our attention. It showed that we did really well but this is not a really accurate way to look at outcomes. So then we did retrospective testing, and this involved a, a lot of physicians. It involved um, 13 surgeons in eight countries, and we had surgeons in Namibia, Africa, and um, you know, places very wide and very varied. But again, the flaw in retrospective testing, especially for artificial intelligence, is that we knew the outcome. So if we knew what the, what the observed outcome was, we could sample the RBF model where, we, where the, the patient ended up. And that too has a flaw in terms of accuracy. But what we noticed was that everybody almost had the same outcome. So that tells us that this is technology driven. So even though retrospective testing may not be the most accurate, the most honest way to look at things from a scientific point of view, we knew we had something special because almost everybody had the same outcome. And remember before we talked about 
only less than 1% of surgeons were at 92% or better for half diopter accuracy. The, mean, the weighted mean value for this group of 3,212 cases was 95%. Holy cow, we've never seen numbers like this before. And then here's our 6% uh, tier. So what, what follows is prospective testing, and that really matters because we don't know what the outcome is going to be, and we do a prospective test. So let me share with you a recent prospective test that we did, and these were sequential surgeries by three different surgeons, um, Mike uh, Snyder, who is Bobby Osher's partner in Cincinnati, my practice in Arizona, and then Steve Scoper in Norfolk, Virginia. Steve is an amazing guy. He does 3,500 cataracts a year, just uh, unbelievable, and has some of the highest quality data I've ever seen. So let me go through the prospective test, and this is a very honest, very straightforward way of looking how, at how a calculation methodology does. So 459 cases, so a, a reasonable sample size in a short period of time. The range of IOLs pretty much mirrors normal human physiology. Very short eyes to extremely long eyes, scary shallow eyes to very deep eyes, and mean Ks, you know, below 40, these are eyes that did not have refractive surgery up into the high 40s. And then we're going to look at the half diopter accuracy, which in today's world is the current benchmark. So for all eyes, we were at 91% within half a diopter. That's every eye over an enormous you know, range of, of parameters. Um, for normal eyes, we were at 92%. And remember, we had the boundary model set at about 90%. So this is keeping with what the engineers at MathWorks have put together for us. For axial myopes, we were 98% within a half a diopter. I have never seen numbers like this before in my career. I've been doing this 31 years, and we didn't even believe this. This is incredible. And then the, the most difficult eyes of all are the short eyes. We all, you know, all of us who operate on short eyes, we know that, you know, we, we might get that dreaded three or four diopter myopic surprise for the eye that took the 30 diopter lens. So here's how we came up with short eyes. So for the RBF method, we were a little bit better than 84% within half a diopter. These are very good numbers. We looked at Holiday 2, I was kind of surprised. It was only about 55%. Hoffer Q was 75, Barrett 79, mm -hmm. and Olson about 81. So it turns out that in today's world, this is probably something new for the short eye. And the short eye is always what's given us the most trouble, hasn't it? And, and Doug Koch and Lee Wong at Baylor University had a paper at Arvo this year that also confirmed that the RBF methodology had the highest accuracy for short eyes of any calculation method they looked at. So here's something. This is a gift to all of you from Hogstrite. It's, it's a website. It's a free open access, access website. And I consider this to be a gift of enormous generosity on behalf of probably the oldest ophthalmic company in the world. Um, Anybody can use this, and I'll go with you, go through with you what the website is. And this, this is, for those of you who don't have the LensStar, this is kind of a taste of, of what's possible if you purchase the LensStar. So the website looks like this. It's just rbfcalculator.com, pretty easy. And if you want to know what this thing is, you can click on the little box in the lower right-hand corner. It says, what is this? And it will give you a, a description. If you're as geeky as all of us are, you can click on this and it'll take you to the Wikipedia page that goes through all the scary math as to how um, radial basis function networks work and you can see actually the, the underlying methodology behind it. You can enter the calculator and this is what it looks like. Right now we're just targeting Plano. We're sampling the RBF model at Plano and, and giving you a range. As we get more cases and Dr. Abulafi and I will be expanding the boundary model later this month for the next software cycle, and we'll probably be doubling the number of cases used, and we'll be concentrating on very, very short eyes, because that's always what gives us the most trouble. So we sample the RBF model at Plano, and then we give you this range of about one diopter uh, to work with. Now there's also a statement down below that as to whether or not this is an inbounds indication. So here's an example of what a calculation looks like. So this is a 30 diopter lens. And you can see down at the bottom it says eye parameters in bounds. So if it's in bounds, we know we have a very, very good chance. 90% means if you have 10 cases, 
nine of them will probably be will be correct and you know one may still you know be outside we're hoping that we can do even better this is um, the same patient but one of the parameters was actually outside the boundary model so even though we got an, an IOL power that one parameter might have been the anterior chamber depth or the central corneal power fell outside of one of our boundary models so it gives you that little caution sign saying that it's an out-of-bounds calculation and perhaps you should use Olson or Barrett or look at something else. And very often, when you get an out-of-bounds indication, it'll line up with the other formulas. It's just that we can't tell you with confidence that we're going to be at that 90% level, so we'll give you an out-of-bounds statement. Now, the other question is, what lens constants do I use? So we spent the last couple months working with the different companies and investigators for some of the new lenses, and we now have on the RBF calculator website a page of all the different lens constants um, that you should use with this calculator. So these are the uh, very popular Alcon lenses, including the, uh, the I think, the panoptics trifocal from the South American data. And, um, and we have most of the popular lenses for United States, Europe, uh, Asia, and Australia. So these are the AMO lenses, including the new Symphony. And then lenses that are very popular here in Europe, Europe like the Physio lens or like the, the Zeiss um, uh, trifocal lens. So all of the Zeiss lenses are on here as well. And if any of you have a favorite lens and, and you we're absolutely sure of the lens constant, I'll be happy to, to add this. And you just send an email to info at rbfcalculator.com and we'll go ahead and add this to the website. Now, this is something interesting. This, I got this, I think, just yesterday. This is some of the analytics. Now, one of the problems, one of the problems we have in ophthalmology is we're all very conservative. And when was the last time you fundamentally changed what you did in surgery or what you did in your office? If you're like me, you don't change very much. So when, in the beginning, when we offered something that was completely new and completely different, we weren't sure what the acceptance would be in the ophthalmic community. Well, in the last 17 weeks, we've had 37,000 calculations on the website. And uh, in one week, we had um, um, close to 4,500 calculations. So this, is be this has become popular in a way that none of us could have really uh, anticipated at all, which is, which is very heartwarming. The calculators also opened other devices, the Almaster 500, Almaster 700, uh, the Aladdin, the, the, the Nidec, the Pentacam AXL, so you can use this with other devices. Again, this is, a, this is an act of enormous generosity on the part of Hogstrite, which is very <laughs> typical for them as a company. Now, this is the software that was um, released day before yesterday from Hogstrite, so if you're a LensStar user, you will have the ability to update your instrument. If you have, I think, the LensStar Plus software package, um, you'll have the ability to do this, and you now have all the important Iowa calculation methods from this century, which is Barrett, Olson, and now the RBF methodology. So these are the three most accurate um, calculation methods currently available, and they're all available on the LensStar as of day before yesterday. And your Hogstrike representative can show you or tell you how to do the update for your LensStar. And if you get a new LensStar, then it, it ships with the instrument. So here's what we have planned for the future. Uh, version 2, which is what Dr. Goldblum and, and Dr. Abulafi and I have been working on, it will expand the boundary model. It will probably double the number of cases, so you'll get fewer out-of-bounds indications. And we're also going to concentrate on the very short eyes. Version 3 is going to concentrate on extremely short eyes, up to 40 diopters for the eye well. And then version 4 is we're going to be adding low power um, lenses of a meniscus design down to minus 10 diopters. So I think in about a year to a year and a half, this may cover pretty much the full range of, of human anatomy. And it will be something, I think, that'll be something special. And we'll still maintain that 90% accuracy. So data collection is going to be an ongoing process. And in, in, in several months, if you put your email address on the calculator, you'll get an email from me three months after you do the calculation asking for the make, model, and power of the IOL and the stable refraction. So all of you can become part of this, this whole process. And these, the LensStar cases on the website will be used to expand the boundary model. And unlike older static formulas, 
this is continuously evolving. So version two is going to be different than version one. It's going to be better and it's going to be more accurate. And this is truly a worldwide collaborative effort. Every one of us has a stake in this game. And in its current form, this is really just the beginning. We're just getting started. And I'm very excited about you know, the future of Iowa power selection. Just think if you never had to worry about the spherical equivalent of an Iowa again. I mean, that would really be worth something. And there are other projects that can come out of this, such as a Tory calculator, which you know, we're considering. So this is where we started on this talk, which is 78%, uh, which is what most people have very capable, conscientious, thoughtful physicians using optical biometry and you know, the older formulas. And this is where we're looking to go. And this is an enormous change. It's a sea change in ophthalmology to be able to have these kinds of outcomes with using uh, the LENSTAR. So my hope is that this elephant in the room that we all take with us every time we go in and we do a case eventually will kind of disappear and fade away. And we just won't have to worry about this anymore. We can worry about other things like sleeping well at night and being happy. Thank you.